So thanks, Stefan, and uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in today. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm snug in my office at uh, Purdue in Indiana um, and talking with you wherever you are, whether it's Iowa or somewhere else. And as Stefan said, I'm going to talk about cover crops and nitrogen management and, and getting started. Um, I've been at Purdue for 39 years as of just a couple of days ago. Um, I work in agronomy in cover crops and their impacts on water quality and soil health. Uh, I work on soil health in general, um, no-till and other systems to improve soil health. Uh, I've done a lot of work on tile drainage and water quality. Uh, some of you may know I've done some work on earthworms as well. Uh, so that's kind of my background. Um, and I was one of the people who helped form the Midwest Cover Crops Council, which I'm going to give you our website uh, at the end of the of the um, discussion as well. And I encourage you to check that out for a wealth of information about cover crops from Iowa or from uh, wherever you happen to be from, as long as it's in the Midwest. If you're beyond the Midwest, the Midwest Cover Crops Council site might not do you um, a lot of direct good, but. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about cover crops. Uh, just a little bit of background. I always like to kind of remind ourselves about what the overall rationale is. For, for growing cover crops. And it's basically to have something living and growing um, at times of the year that we typically don't have something living and growing when we're in a summer annual cropping system, such as corn and soybeans, for example. Um, so we basically, uh, those, those plants that are living and growing can capture sunlight and photosynthesize, exude carbon compounds, feed those soil organisms, uh, trap and recycle nutrients that would otherwise be lost if we didn't have something growing, and basically overall improve soil health. So we're making better use of the resources and the time that's available to us uh, during a, a full year. Another way to, to look at it is to see a, a photo. Um, this was at the Purdue Agronomy Farm a, a number of years ago now, but you can see uh, this was an early harvest year. It was early September and the soybeans and corn in these particular plots were already harvested. Uh, so they're brown. They're brown all September, October, November. Um, they're brown or white maybe if we have snow, uh, December through you know the rest of the winter. They're brown again in March, brown most of April. On the other hand, the grass strip, this wasn't even a cover crop study, it was just the grass strip, the grass alleyway green and growing, photosynthesizing, putting carbon into the soil, feeding those soil organ organisms, uh, trapping and, and recycling nutrients. So what we're doing is trying to shrink that brown gap uh, and, and expand the green and growing period, much like what mother nature has, wherever, wherever you're from, whether that's Iowa or Indiana or somewhere else, uh, Mother Nature normally has something growing for longer than the four to five months that we have corn and soybeans growing. And so we're really just trying to mimic that a little bit more, have something growing for as, as long of a time period um, as we can during the year. Besides the improvement in soil health and, and soil conditions, um, there are studies throughout the Midwest. Iowa has a lot of them. Indiana has a lot, Illinois, Ohio. Those tile drain studies consistently show that where we have good cover crop growth, we reduce the nitrate leaching into tile drains. Um, and this can be on the order of half. If we have good cover crop growth, it may cut in half the amount of nitrate that goes into that tile drainage water and then gets up in surface waters. Um, and what happens to that nitrogen? Well, that nitrogen goes into your soil nitrogen bank account. I do wanna point out that it's more like a, a CD or a, a certificate of deposit where you can't withdraw it right away, right? So if you've kept 20 pounds of nitrogen out of the tile drains this year, you can't reduce your, your uh, nitrogen rate next year by 20 pounds because it's going into that bank account. It's helping build soil organic matter and you're improving that overall organic matter and, and uh, soil nitrogen. Um, but then with time, some of that will start to, to recycle. So you're not losing it, uh, but you can't take it out right away. Cover crops, of course, are just part of a system that you might have in your field or on your farm. And there are different potential benefits and challenges uh, for each type of cover crop. And you do need to adapt your, your cropping system. And so you may need to make some changes to nutrient management. And that's part of what we're gonna talk about today. 
um, or maybe to your tillage or no tillage system. Uh, you may have to change some things in how you handle manure or pest management or crop rotation and so on. Um, it's not just an add-on practice that you wake, wake up one day and say, I'm going to go plant cover crops, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's a learning curve. Uh, you need to do your homework. And I tell that to my fellow researchers, to my fellow extension folks, right, to conservation agency folks, as well as to uh, farmers and crop advisors, that there is homework to be done and we need to, to learn some things. And there's a lot of ways to learn some of that before you take your first um, attempt at actually growing cover crops. <clears throat> I always encourage people to really sit down and think about more, more directly, what is it that you want the cover crops to do? So if you're thinking about which cover crops to grow, the first thing is to ask yourself, well, what is my main purpose in growing cover crops on this field, for example? Um, <clears throat> questions like, you know, well, what's my cropping and tillage system? What's my current cash crop and my next cash crop? Uh, what kind of a tillage or no tillage system do I have? What time windows do I actually have available? Um, how am I gonna seed that cover crop? Um, and then a lot of specific questions like my soil type and climate and, and um, you know, is it drought prone here? Uh, do I have herbicide carryover and things like that. The questions that are, are shown in green here, the uh, MCCC or Midwest Cover Crops Council that I mentioned, we have a decision tool and that decision tool can help you uh, with answering um, some of those questions. So I will refer you to that again at the end of the talk. There are many different uh, cover crop species and, and varieties, but we often categorize them into the three main categories of uh, grasses, brassicas, and, and legumes. Uh, the grasses, of course, have a very have fibrous roots, and so they're very good at building soil structure or soil tilth, soil aggregation, aggregate stability. Uh, they're also excellent nitrogen scavengers. The brassicas, the uh, daikon radish on the right, is one of the the uh, kind of popular ones right now. Um, and it's, it's uh, also, they are also very good nitrogen scavengers uh, and they have a, a long tap root. And so they can be very good for reducing uh, compaction problems in, in some fields. Uh, and then finally, of course, the legumes on the bottom, we've got crimson clover shown here, uh, but legumes are going to fix nitrogen. And so we use them when we want to, to uh, add some nitrogen to our system. So today I'm going to be focusing on the primarily the grasses and the legumes uh, when we're talking about nitrogen cycling. So usually if we're talking about nitrogen and cover crops, um, we're talking about one or the other of these factors, right? So we might be talking about legumes. We want to grow legumes like this crimson clover um, to fix nitrogen, biologically fix nitrogen uh, for succeeding crops. So if that's the case, usually our questions revolve around, first of all, how much nitrogen actually gets fixed, uh, and then how much of that nitrogen gets released, and when does it get released? If, on the other hand, we're planting a non-legume, a grass or possibly the brassica, to trap or scavenge nitrogen, then our question usually is how much nitrogen gets trapped, and then how much of that gets released and when does it get released, okay? So those are the questions that I'm gonna to try to talk about a little bit more, but I want you to um, just kind of have in the front of your brain that we're really talking two different things. One is fixing nitrogen, one is scavenging nitrogen. <clears throat> it's not to say that legumes don't scavenge nitrogen, they do, but if our primary goal is to scavenge or trap residual soil nitrogen, then we're generally not gonna be planting a legume. We're gonna plant a, a grass or a, or a brassica. Okay, so let's take a look first at the nitrogen scavenging crops at like cereal rye or oats or annual ryegrass or winter triticale, a number of different things. The amount of biomass that's produced by that cover crop is the key to the amount of nutrient uptake that you're going to get. Uh, obviously, if a cover crop doesn't grow, then you're not going to scavenge any nitrogen, okay? So you're looking for getting a good stand and getting some rapid growth so that you can actually scavenge some of that nitrogen from the soil. Then the age and the stage of the plant when it's killed, whether that's by winter or whether that's by herbicide or whether that's by roller crimp or whatever termination method you're using, 
um, that's going to determine the nitrogen percent in that plant, the carbon nitrogen or C to N ratio, the plant composition, like how much um, uh, 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 lignin and cellulose and so on do you have, right? So how old the plant is and what stage it's at is going to affect that. Those plant factors along with the long-term climate and the short-term weather and the soil type and the termination timing and the method, those are all gonna to contribute to determining the decomposition rate. And this is really very difficult to predict, which is I'm sure not what uh, most of you were hoping to hear today. Um, and I wish I had a formula that was uh, foolproof that would allow you to know this, but uh, we don't have that. So all of those things contribute to how fast uh, the decomposition occurs and that nitrogen becomes available. The typical nitrogen scavenging uh, crops are the, the grasses, um, whether they uh, winter kill or are winter hardy. Uh, but again, the, the brassicas are also um, used as well. All right, I'm gonna go through uh, two slides that kind of look at this nitrogen availability from residue additions. Residues in this case, meaning uh, dead cover crop material, uh, but it can be any kind of organic material that is added. <clears throat> On the vertical axis there, we have the available soil nitrogen, um, whatever it is uh, as we start uh, this process, okay? And I've got a straight line there for some, some level of available soil nitrogen that's present in the soil. What happens when we add a high carbon residue to the soil, whether that's maybe corn stalks or whether that's a wheat straw, something that's really highly carbonaceous. What happens to that nitrogen, that available soil nitrogen? <clears throat> Many of you are already aware, of course, that that nitrogen level goes down for a while first, um, and then it comes back up. That going down, that uh, reduction in available soil nitrogen is what's called immobilization or tie-up of nitrogen. So what's happening here is the microorganisms are decomposing that high carbon residue and as they're doing that, there's not enough nitrogen in that residue to fully decompose it. So the microbes take nitrogen from the soil, okay? So they immobilize any of that available nitrogen that was in the soil or tie it up for some time period. After decomposition has proceeded for a while, um, and that amount of time depends, then uh, the microbes have, have decomposed that material enough that some of the microbes start to die and then um, their bodies get decomposed by other microbes. And so then we start to have some release or mineralization of the nitrogen that was in that material. So the depth of this decrease in available soil nitrogen <clears throat> and the amount of time that it takes to go from immobilization to mineralization um, varies based on all those factors I talked about before, your soil type, your climate, the weather that particular period of time, the carbon nitrogen ratio, um, a lot of different things go into that. And that's why we find it very difficult to say how much nitrogen might get released from a high carbon residue um, after it's been added to the soil. Okay, let's take a look at the other, kind of the other end of the spectrum. <clears throat> so again, we have, we're starting out with some level of available soil nitrogen, and now we're gonna add a low carbon residue or a high nitrogen residue. So such as a, a legume, right? A young legume, hairy vetch or <laughs> crimson clover or, or something like that. So what happens with that is it's low carbon. There's enough nitrogen in it that it doesn't, uh, the decomposition of it does not tie up any nitrogen. There's no nitrogen immobilization. Um, and we get simply mineralization or release of N as that material is decomposed, okay? So this is why, uh, again, you wanna be really careful and think through the kind of cover crop you're growing um, if you're looking to, to grow something that's got a high nitrogen demand like corn. And that's what this table is really referring to. Um, this is a, a table just giving some example carbon nitrogen or C to N ratios of some uh, common um, organic materials. So you can see newspaper is up at the top of this table, highly carbonaceous, as you know, and it's got a C to N ratio of, of about 120 to one. Wheat straw, cereal rye straw would be similar, 
has a C to N ratio of about 80 to one. Rye, cereal rye cover crop at anthesis or pollination time is about 37 to one. And you can see I've got red arrows here. So maybe I'll tell you what the colors are here in a minute. Cereal rye cover crop when it's younger or veg vegetative has a ratio of about 26 to one, which is pretty much neutral for nitrogen. And then hairy vetch and other legume cover crops have a much lower C to N ratio of about 11 to one. And you can see the soil microbes themselves, their bodies are about eight to one. They, you know, highly, pro, uh, highly protein, proteinaceous um, and a very low C to N ratio. So what's the, what's the magic number that I'm kind of interested in? Well, 25 to one is, is the approximate break even point. Okay, so C to N ratios that are wider than 25 to one generally cause nitrogen immobilization for some time period. So somewhere right around 25 to one is kind of neutral. You're not gonna tie up nitrogen, but you're not gonna release nitrogen either. And of course, 25 to one is not an exact number, right? So somewhere in the 20 to 30 range, you're basically gonna have a neutral impact on, on soil nitrogen. Higher than that, you're gonna tie it up lower than that, you're just going to um, release it. You're not gonna tie it up. So if you are utilizing cover crops that have a wide C to N ratio, you've got a couple of things to think about, a couple of choices. You should either, one, allow time for adequate decomposition of that material before you use, um, before you plant a high nitrogen using crop like corn, okay? And or, you could apply extra starter nitrogen to help with the decomposition of that um, high carbon material without hurting your corn. And or you could maybe choose, um, don't choose high carbon nitrogen ratio covers before corn. I'm gonna go through what we call some uh, cover crop recipe in just a little while. And it is based in part on these nitrogen considerations for people growing cover crops, particularly if you're just starting out with cover crops, right? So again, 25 to one is kind of our, our break even point for those nitrogen scavenging crops. All right, now we're gonna switch gears. Um, now we're gonna talk about the ones that you grow specifically because you want to produce nitrogen and fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, there are many challenges to their use for providing significant nitrogen to your next crop. Um, and one of them is simply that folks in Iowa and Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, um, although we're not as far north as, as other areas, we're far enough north that we have too short of a growth period to produce enough biomass to fix enough nitrogen um, if you're talking about full season corn in a field crop system, okay? Uh, there have been consistently good results further south. Uh, even Kentucky is further south than Indiana, and that's enough further south that they get longer winter growth and can have uh, appreciable nitrogen contribution to the next corn crop. But um, Indiana and Iowa and north, it's, it's really quite a challenge uh, to do that uh, because most of the nitrogen gets fixed <clears throat> in May a lot of times, which is uh, you need to let your legume grow uh, most of the way through May if you're going to be growing corn. And, and if you're in a typical corn soybean rotation, you don't want to wait that long. Um, there, there are good results and have been good results, uh, you know, for, for a long time where people have uh, frost seeded clover into winter wheat, for example. Um, and, and then um, after the winter wheat is harvested, they, they continue to let the clover grow and, and they may or may not take a, a hay cutting or one or two cuttings off. But um, so Ontario, for example, their, their nitrogen credits to corn with this kind of a system where they have good red clover growth is somewhere in the order of 50 to 70 pounds of nitrogen per acre, depending, depending on a whole bunch of specific things, right? But that's the kind of uh, thing that can be done but that's not your standard corn rotation, right? You're talking about uh, having wheat in the rotation. Certainly, of course, legumes are often used before organic vegetable crops, um, and, and they're generally incorporated into the soil <clears throat> before planting vegetables. Uh, that is not my area of expertise at all. I would refer you to people who do that 
Um, but that's a, that is a common area where legumes are grown and, and provide significant nitrogen. Um, there is new work being done in, in the Midwest region of trying some other clovers and Balanza clover seems to be the one that people are looking at right now and allowing it to continue to grow into the early part of the corn growing season. So there's new work going on trying to get more of that kind of nitrogen contribution. But at the moment, um, in more northern climates, that's really very um, difficult. Those legumes can still be useful as part of a mix though for increasing soil health and soil organic matter and biodiversity. It's just that you don't necessarily want to count on getting uh, very much nitrogen credit to your next crop. How do you estimate those nitrogen credits? This is again one of those things that's, that's really very difficult. There's no easy formula. There are people that are working on it. Uh, but again, that decomposition and release and availability of that nitrogen depend on, on many factors that are not readily um, predictable. Um, it's going to depend on this particular species, like is it red clover, is it hairy vetch, is you know Austrian winter pea, what is it? How much biomass did it produce? And at the time that it gets terminated, what is the carbon nitrogen ratio? It's usually pretty narrow, but there are differences even within that. It also depends on, on soil type. Um, it depends on, on termination method and timing and whether it gets incorporated or not. A lot of the vegetable crops, of course, incorporate that material. Um, and it depends on the climate and weather. I was having a conversation with a colleague in North Dakota just last week, and she was talking about them not getting nitrogen credits, even when they've had good legume stands. Um, and I reminded her, not that she needed to be reminded, but that it's pretty darn cold and dry where she is up in North Dakota, uh, especially compared to Indiana, but even compared to Iowa, right? So, so th what that means is that the decomposition of the legume does not proceed very quickly because it's too cold um, and it's too, too dry. Um, if you look at some of the older approximations, some of the older literature on nitrogen credits uh, from legumes, uh, they often come from um, warmer, wetter climates. Um, in the US, a lot of that work was done in more southerly uh, parts of the, of the uh, country. Um, there's also work in the western part of Oregon, which is, um, which is more moderated and certainly wetter than, than uh, climate in, in Iowa, for example. So it's uh, very challenging. And usually you're gonna need some other nitrogen source as well as the legume. So whether that's fertilizer, um, if you're not in an organic system or if you're organic, whether that's manure and compost or other organic materials, um, in addition to that legume cover to, to get enough nitrogen for your main crop. <clears throat> Some of the possibilities for estimating nitrogen credits, and again, um, there's not really a good formula that, that somebody can give you for Iowa or for Indiana for uh, in particular. Um, but in Iowa, the pre cidrus nitrate test, PSNT, is, is used for things like um, alfalfa and manure contributions. And so that's a possibility to get some idea of what your nitrogen status is um, before cidrus. Um, you could conduct your own nitrogen rate strip trials on a legume versus cover crop versus a no cover crop. Um, if the legume is part of a mix that contains grasses and brassicas as opposed to being just the legume itself, um, a lot of the work seems to show there's not, uh, the, the nitrogen credit is, is quite small um, unless the legume is the dominant um, component of that cover crop mix. All right, so that kind of gives the background about nitrogen cycling and how that may be affected by uh, different cover crops. And what I wanna do now is, is move into um, how do you get started with cover crops? And of course, there are many farmers and crop advisors that are interested in using cover crops for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, soil health, nitrogen scavenging, erosion control, weed suppression, and so on. Uh, but the question is how to start, because there really are so many different options, so many species, so many different management choices and decisions that sometimes uh, it's, it's overwhelming to people. It's like, oh my gosh, just tell me what to do. Um, and we resisted that for a long time, uh, but then we realized that, that for some folks that are just starting with cover crops, maybe providing what we're calling recipes uh, would be a good thing. And so 
we offer these recipes with that in that spirit. Uh, these are aimed at new cover crop users to learn the basic management, to get some experience, get your feet wet with relatively low risk. Uh, and then after that, there's many other possibilities um, after you learn the basics. Um, at least for, for people who are like me, when you're learning something new, I kind of like to step in slowly, you know, say, okay, let me, let me try this out in the easy way. And then once I get a little more comfortable with it, then I'll delve into it, you know, more and try something more complicated. So that's kind of what these recipes are aimed at. So if you're new uh, to cover crops, hopefully these will be helpful to you. Um, if you are experienced at cover crops, hopefully these will uh, refresh your memory on a few things, but also maybe give you a few tips as you're working with a friend or a neighbor or a family member or a client um, on integrating cover crops into your system to kind of remember some of the things that, that might make it easier for them to start. Okay, these are the, the cover crop recipes. Uh, and what I've shown here are the Iowa cover crop recipes. Uh, but we have these for almost every state in the Midwest region, as well as the province of Ontario that are uh, members of the Midwest Cover Crops Council. So uh, you can go to our website shown there um, and you can get the Iowa recipes or the Indiana recipes. Uh, for Iowa State, you also have, I also have the Iowa State publication numbers there. You can go to the Iowa State Extension store. Um, and so for post corn going to soybean, we're suggesting using cereal rye. For post soybean going to corn, we're suggesting using oats. And I'm gonna step through that fairly quickly here. Um, these are one page front and back uh, recipes that we hope will tell you everything you need to do, everything you need to know um, to try cover crops in a relatively low risk way. Okay, so cereal rye, as it turns out, is often uh, the chosen cover crop because it's the most winter hardy and the wa most widely adaptable across northern regions. You can plant it later than just about anything else. Um, it almost always grows. Um, and so it, it does happen to be the cover crop that is recommended for one of those two years. This is showing cereal rye growing in corn stalks in southeastern Indiana at one of the Purdue farms. Um, but but uh, cereal rye is a good one. And so how we suggest people start is to start, and, and these recipes are for a corn soybean rotation. There are also some recipes on the website for uh, after corn silage, if you happen to be one of the folks um, that, that has corn silage. Okay, so step one is to start after corn harvest and plant cereal rye into the, the corn stalks. Ideally, no-till drill, but if not that, then a vertical tillage machine uh, with an air seeder mounted on it is, is a good way to get um, the, the cereal rye planted or aerial seeding. I'm not gonna go into the, the really gory details about seeding rates and seeding dates and all those kinds of things. Those are available by county uh, for all of the states in the Midwest plus Ontario um, if you go to our website and look at our selector tool or decision tool, um, and also the recipes for your state has that information in it. All right, so you get the cereal rye planted in the fall, it, it grows, um, it goes dormant in, in um, winter, and it comes back again in spring. So now you're going to terminate it before you plant your soybeans. The preferred option is to spray that two weeks before planting or when the cereal rye is short, six to 12 inches tall. Um, again, this is whichever comes first. Um, why do we recommend that? Again, especially if you're just starting with cover crops because the herbicide works effectively on the undamaged cereal rye plants. Uh, the cover's dead before planting and you have less residue to plant through. Um, as you gain more experience, you can wait later, but don't do that the first time, please. <laughs> Okay, what happens if it's one of those springs where it's very wet and you try and try and try, but you just can't get in the field and uh, now the cereal rye is, is waist high or, or higher? Um, what do you do then? Well, then you're looking at spraying it right close to plan, okay? And there's differences of opinion and there's advantages and risks with each of these two alternatives. One is to spray it one or two days before you plant with the forecast that says you're gonna be able to plant, that there's no rain in between, or 
you plant and then spray immediately after, meaning the same day or within one to two days. Again, with the forecast that you're not gonna get rain in between. The advantages and the risks of each option um, would take a lot more time to go through. We have them listed in a Purdue publication listed here. Um, but basically it revolves around if you end up getting rain in between the two things that you're doing, um, then you're gonna have a, a challenge. So, um, but at least with soybeans, you're not worried about nitrogen tie up. You're not worried about army worms, right? The soybeans fix their own nitrogen. So that's why the cereal rye before soybeans is a, is a pretty good first step. All right, so then you go ahead and plant your soybean. Ideally, no-till plant the soybean into that cereal rye uh, cover. We also suggest people consider short season variety of soybeans and earlier planting. But at a minimum, at least look at the, the range of soybean varieties that you normally, um, and maturities that you normally buy for your farm and plant the earliest maturity soybeans first or early and plant them on fields that are gonna go to cover crop. And the reason is very simple. You want to give yourself more opportunity in the fall. You wanna get the soybeans off earlier so that you have other options of cover crops in the fall than just cereal rye, right? So getting those things in and out earlier will help you out. Okay, so you've grown your soybeans, you've harvested your soybeans, and now you're ready to plant a cover crop after soybeans. We suggest you plant cover crops that winter kill. Um, and in Iowa, uh, the recommendation is just oats. In Indiana and, and some, some of our states where we have a, a little warmer climate, we, we recommend an oats daikon radish mix. But in, in most of Iowa, you just don't have time for the radish to do enough uh, to make it worthwhile if you're planting um, after your soybeans. The, <clears throat> those cover crops, whether alone or together, have a low carbon nitrogen ratio and they both winter kill. So there's no termination issues, uh, timing issues before corn. So you don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get this killed on time before planting my corn and not being late and so on. If they winter kill, you don't have to worry about that. And then step five is basically to plant your corn into that dead cover, um, preferably no-till planting, but if you're not doing no-till, um, there are certainly alternatives of fall strip till as late as possible uh, so that you don't, uh, so that you get the most you can out of the cover crop, or maybe shallow vertical till in the spring. We do recommend that people consider, um, strongly consider a starter fertilizer two by two uh, with 30 to 50 pounds of, of nitrogen per acre. Um, not, to, <clears throat> not to add to the total nitrogen, but just to front end load it a little bit. So put more on as starter and less on <clears throat> as, as your side dress. And the reason for this is that even though the C to N ratio of the, of the oats is, is not um, as high as other cereals, um, the, by having the starter, you're going to uh, reduce any chance for nitrogen tie up that might be possible from the dead oats. And it gives your corn a, a faster start. All right, so let me give you some uh, additional resources besides the ones that uh, Stefan mentioned that are on the, the website uh, for this conference. So again, the Midwest Cover Crops Council, mccc.msu.edu, um, is a great resource for all kinds of things. Uh, we have our selector tool or decision tool there. We've got the recipes. Uh, we have a video webinar of the Indiana recipes in a lot more detail, and that would apply to Iowa other than the specific uh, dates. Uh, we have a cover crops field guide, pocket guide, uh, five bucks from the Purdue Extension Education Store um, that has all the different cover crops uh, that, we, that we generally use in the region and, and a lot of information about them. Um, so I've also listed my speaker contact information there. Um, and Stefan, at 34 minutes, I think I'm going to stop and see what kinds of uh, questions we might have. So I'll leave this up here for a few minutes at least. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eileen. That was a lot of awesome stuff. And we do have some uh, questions uh, in the chat box. So uh, I'll, I'll take them in the order that they came uh, as they trickled in. Uh, okay. So previously, you, t you showed that slide that of different C to N ratios of different uh, organic materials. Dio had a question, assuming that those are above ground portions of the plants. 
Oh, um, great question. Theo had a question about the C to N ratio of cereal rye roots, and if you can address that. <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> um, no, that's an excellent question that the, the C to N ratio of the roots is different than the tops for sure. Um, some plant species, the roots are actually more carbonaceous um, than the tops. I don't know. I, I don't know offhand what it is for, for cereal rye. I would suspect it would be wider than the tops. I mean, the roots in general are a little more woody, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but I, I don't know. That's, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a, I'm just going to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, because of the difficulty of sampling roots and determining a biomass of roots in general, most of the cover crop work, as well as most of the recommendations and stuff are based off of the top growth, while realizing that, of course, there's a lot of material below ground as well. Um, but we often use the top growth as kind of an indicator and we kind of, we don't exactly ignore it, but we don't take into account the, the roots because most people don't want it. They, they're willing to cut an above ground bit of cover crop maybe, but they're not willing to, to go and dig out roots and figure out you know, the weight of roots and, and the composition of the roots, so. I did some of that in my younger days, but I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, we'll move on. Here's a, a question about, um, you mentioned, I think, Eileen, about uh, either winter or chemical or roller crimper killing of cover cr crops. There's a question about tillage. Do certain tillage methods and depths, so mulberry plow versus vertical till versus rotovator, allow for more rapid nitrogen release from our cover crops. So how does tillage depth uh, and method maybe play into that? Can you speak to that? Yes. Um, you will find differences of opinion on that if you're talking about long-term no-till systems where the systems have become really biologically active. There are some uh, folks that that are suggesting that it actually decomposes faster in a no-till system than in a tilled system. I would say that the, that's kind of an active, I'll get to the tilled question in a minute, but the no-till versus tilled, um, that would be an active area of research and some disagreements right now on, on that, but that would be if you're long-term no-till and you've developed a really biologically active system, um, not if you're kind of relatively new to no-till, um, the tilling this tilling the material into the soil generally is thought to increase the rate of release because you're physically breaking up the material and you're physically mixing it with the soil where the microbes are but you don't want to bury it. <clears throat> so when it gets moldboard plow, for example, it gets buried in a layer down fairly deep and sometimes it's lacking oxygen. And so actually it doesn't decompose very well in a typical plow system compared to where it's mixed a little more shallowly, whether that's chisel, which is of course mixed over a range of depths or whether that's vertical till where it's mixed in just to the surface. I don't know that we have any data that would really compare a vertical till to, to a chisel, but I do, do know that moldboard plow often, it kind of backfires in the sense that it's now buried at eight inches or 10 inches and it's buried in a mat and, and a lot of times does not decompose as well as where it's mixed a little bit more finely over a wider range of soil depths. Does that kind of make sense? Maybe? I think so. I think that's a tricky question that um, researchers have looked into over the years. And I've seen various iterations of what you kind of mentioned, Eileen, in terms of does so sometimes tilling does increase it, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's just the same as no-till. I, I think it depends on a lot of other different factors, but thanks for your take on that. Um, 
you spoke a lot about uh, corn soybean rotations or corn silage soybean rotations. Luke has got a question about uh, an extended rotation or a diversified rotation that involves field pea that would be harvested in July here in Iowa. Um, can you comment on or recommend any kind of cover crops that one might plant after field pea in, in July and that's going to corn the next year? Mixes or, or sole crops um, that come to mind. <laughs> So the advantage of anything that's harvested in July is that you obviously have uh, quite a long time compared to after corn or soybeans to, to plant something else. Um, that's where um, cocktail mixes are, are, you know, what people call cocktail mixes are sometimes um, used by people. I've seen that used more after wheat, um, I don't know that I, I don't know that I'm um, aware of recommendations after P. So I don't, I don't have a specific recommendation, but I do know, for example, that anything like a cocktail mix, whether that's a 15 way mix or a 10 way mix or a five way mix or a three way mix, um, what would be nice is to be able to grow some of the nitrogen that either would help your corn in spite of all the things I just said, or that would combine along with um, the grasses that you're growing in order to help improve soil organic matter. So um, after, after field pea, I would imagine that has relatively low, light residue, just kind of like soybeans and so on. And so you'd want to have at least one grass in there. Um, if you're planting it in, in um, July or early August, cereal rye won't do as well, but oats would do really well. So you could have something fast growing in the warmer uh, temperatures like oats. You could put in some cereal rye if you're ready to deal with terminating that um, before corn or, or just go with the oats. Um, and I, I don't know what legume you would want. You, that's where, you know, a legume following a legume, um, you'd have to ask somebody else that's got more of that plant background. I, I'm gonna beg off on, on which legume but it would be nice to have at least oats and maybe one legume and, and maybe the brassica. At that point, the daikon radish um, could be good to scavenge some of that nitrogen as well and to break up any shallow compacted layers. The other thing that people will do instead is to grow um, a summer, uh, you know, a real summer grass like sorghum sedan grass um, or pearl millet or something like that. If you want a lot of biomass, if, if part of the purpose would be to build uh, soil organic matter, then grow something like that because they, you know, they're truly summer grasses and they're going to really take off in, in the summer. Um, so that's, that's a few of my thoughts. It's, it's not a specific answer, of course. <laughs> I, I think what you're saying is that there's a lot of options there and um, some of these um, guides or selector tools, Eileen, that you've pointed folks to might be of, of use there in terms of a summer planted cover crop, either at winter killing or, or overwintering. So yes, let's... thank you. That's a good, no, 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 that's a good lead in. Use our selector tool and decide what your top couple of goals are. And it, the selector tool is, you know, put in your county, your state, your county, when you want to, uh, plant something and, and uh, that'll come up with some ideas as well. Yes, thank you, it'll rank them. And, and that selector tool that is, that is linked, I put the Midwest Cover Crops um, site in the chat box, the selector tool is linked there and it is new and improved recently. So do check that out. Um, it's you can really use slick. it on your mobile phone. Yeah. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's a question from Dick. Um, he's asking about is using a, uh, is a, is a university nitrogen rate calculator kind of like the maximum return to nitrogen um, what calculator that we have here? Uh, is that valid for farmers using soil health practices and cover crops? Uh, in the calculator online, the only choices are location and preceding crop of corn or soybeans. You can't select that you have a cover crop or a, a diversified practice. So can you comment on, on those calculators, Eileen, at all? Sure, that's, that's a, a great question. Um, I would say the first couple years into a cover cropping system, they're probably uh, perfectly valid as they are. 
um, once a system has really, um, really developed into a highly biological system, um, which is difficult to define, but you know, if you're 10 years into a system where you have been growing a lot of cover crops, then I would say um, they may not be, you may be getting to the point where you're recycling back some of that nitrogen that I said was in your soil nitrogen bank account. Uh, and so then those recommendations probably would need to be tweaked. There really needs to be some trials on that, um, some research on that. Uh, but I would caution people to not change their nitrogen rates too early, right? I mean, it's going to be at least five years, I think, uh, and probably longer before that that really biologically active system um, becomes good enough that it can start to provide more of that nitrogen. Okay, thanks, Eileen. M moving on, here's here's a question from Greg. Um, he says, corn takes up nitrogen from the soil and then ask, where does it go? Is it stored in the plant? Is it in the corn kernels? If it's in the plant, the nitrogen should still be there in the roughage. How long does it need to be in the soil to decompose before that nitrogen is available for plant use? So I think there's a couple questions there. How does nitrogen get allocated within corn plant and then the leftover corn plant? How does that um, decompose and turn over? Right, so the, the nitrogen allocation in the plant changes during the course of the growing season. Um, and of course, by the time you are ready to harvest the grain, there's a substantial amount of nitrogen that is removed from the field in the grain. Uh, but it's not all of the nitrogen that was taken up. Um, the rest of the nitrogen, as was commented, is in the, is in the corn stover. Um, and that gets returned to the soil. The corn stover is one of those high C to N ratio materials that I was talking about with the, with the, um, the table and the, the recycling. The kind of the common, um, when, we were, when we were in a, a standard rotation for many, many years, kind of the simplified version of thinking about that was that the amount that gets immobilized every year by that corn stalk um, decomposing is approximately equal to the amount that gets released the next year from that corn stalk. So we're kind of in a steady state, okay? And that's a, that's a pretty good way of you know, simplifying and approximating um, if a field has been growing corn for many years or in a corn soybean system. Um, so if, if you're harvesting corn in the fall, some of that nitrogen from the corn stover <clears throat> is probably being released um, in the spring and early summer. And that's probably part of what's being fed into your, your crop, right? But some of the fertilizer that you put on then gets taken up and immobilized by um, organisms. A lot of the nitrogen that goes in the corn actually is not, if you follow the molecules of nitrogen, it's not from this year's fertilizer. It's from soil microorganisms that took up some of last year's fertilizer, right? So, so the actual molecule is difficult to, to track. And we're really looking at some of what you put on gets tied up by the organisms. Some of what you put on a year ago gets released by the organisms. So some of what you put on is in this year's corn residue, but doesn't get released for a couple of years. Um, but the... In general, um, the corn stover itself is going to be tying up nitrogen and only releasing it quite a bit later. What's quite a bit later? Next year. All right, let's uh, move along. Here's a question from Barney and Suzanne. They're asking about what if you planted uh, an oat cover crop in very early spring or late winter, say end of February. So very early seeding in the year of a cover crop. Uh, that's going to be really green when turned over with like maybe a shallow incorporation. How would you model the effect on soil nitrogen availability for either corn or soybeans that would then uh, succeed that very early oat planting? How do you think that soil dynamics would be affected by that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it's still uh, very, very green, you know, vegetative, it's not heading out or doing anything like that. 
Um, <clears throat> that's probably going to be uh, fairly neutral on the nitrogen. It's it's going to be in that um, it's it's not going to tie it up, but it's not going to give you give you back um, any of that nitrogen either. Um, so it, it wouldn't mo most likely would not be functioning like a legume to give you nitrogen, but it's it's taken up some of that nitrogen that would have been lost otherwise. Uh, that's that's what I would would bet on that. And, and it would hold soil in place too from wind and, and rain. So that would be good as well, I'd imagine. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It has those other benefits of a cover crop, which is is uh, minimizing erosion for sure. And, and it's gonna help improve soil health because you've got, you know, anytime you have something growing, you've got those carbon compounds that are leaking out and that are feeding the soil microorganisms. So I think it would be neutral from nitrogen standpoint, but it would be very beneficial for all of the other reasons that we like to grow cover crops or many of the other reasons yeah something better than nothing that's always a good motto uh i agree with that <laughs> okay uh moving uh moving on uh bill's got a question have you ever interceded a cover crop into soybeans uh when we could plant with like an eight row interseeder between the rows so i know there's been a lot of work questions about interceding into corn what about interceding into soybeans uh with an interseeder any are you familiar with that, Eileen, or have you tried anything like that? Um, no, I, I haven't tried that. I haven't heard of that. Um, the, you know, you can interseed, interseed a cover crop by aerial seeding into uh, almost mature soybeans. And, and so I don't know that interseeding it early would be um, a particular benefit. Um, the, the challenge with interseed, with early interseeding, whether it's corn or soybeans is, um, you know, getting it established, getting it uh, growing a little bit, but then not competing with your main crop and not being shaded out and killed. Um, interseeding, you know, aerial seeding or interseeding into uh, standing soybeans right before leaf drop starts is a pretty good method. So I'd be more inclined, I think, to think about that than, than thinking about planting it into the soybeans early, but, um, but no, I'm not aware of anybody doing that or trying that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, okay. Well, uh, Eileen, we've also gotten some questions about non-row crops. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to address these. You might be able to point these folks in the right direction. There's uh, a question about cover crops use in orchards, uh, if you can comment on that or point people in the direction. And there's also a question about using cover crops uh, with potatoes. Uh, or between uh, the rows of potatoes. So uh, I don't know if you can speak to that directly, but can you point these folks in the right direction? Um, yeah, I can't speak to either of those directly. Um, depending on where, what states those folks are from, um, they, may, they may have um, somebody at their land grant that could um, address that. I was thinking we have a cover crop uh, selector tool ve vegetable version, but that wouldn't handle orchards. And I don't know whether it would handle potatoes or not. Um, if I was talking about, P if, if they're folks from Indiana, I would point them to the horticulture department at Purdue um, as a place to start um, or to our, um, the folks who do organic uh, work. So depending on what state they're from, if their land grant has anybody working with organics or, or, or veggies. Um, I, I touted the Midwest Cover Crops Council site because we're in the Midwest, but there are now also other regional groups. Um, the Western Cover Crops Council, which might be if the potato folks are from Idaho, <laughs> Is, is relatively new. They're, they're just kind of getting going. So there might be some people there. Um, and you can just Google, you know, Western Cover Crops Council. If they're from the Northeast or the Southeast, uh, the Northeast has the Northeast Cover Crops Council. The South has the Southern Cover Crops Council. And those, those two groups are maybe three years old now. Um, and so there, there may be something there. Uh, although again, the, the major emphasis for all of those groups are our field crops. Um, but yeah, in Indiana, I'd point them to the horticulture department um, or, or to our organic farming group 
for suggestions on that. Great, they shared the, the orchard is in Indiana and the potatoes are from Wisconsin, oh. which not too oh surprising. Gosh. I'm, I'm from Wisconsin. I know there's a lot of potatoes growing in the central portion of that state. So um, thanks, though, for Eileen uh, possibly pointing people in the right direction. And there's some comments in the chat box, too, to help address those. Okay. Um, I'll, we've got time for one more question. Um, and let's see. I'm going to pick one. How do you find the legume expert in your area? <laughs> so from different, do you, do you know a good resource or a, a conclave of people that you could point people to that are curious about legumes in our various states that are represented? Uh, if you're talking about the university type people, then I would, I would uh, you know, look at an agronomy or an integrated management uh, type department. If you're talking about uh, um, yeah, yeah, places, places like, like PFI, PFI uh, like you next year. You know, um, reputable seed companies that have dealt with, particularly with forages, um, they have been very helpful to us as we've expanded some of our information uh, because they know the legumes. I mean, they're growing them as for grazing. Uh, but they kind of know the, the characteristics of the different legumes and when you have to have them planted and how much nitrogen they might fix and things like that. So, so you might, you might kind of check out some of those kinds of companies that sell seed for forages. That's, they're often very good legume experts. And I would caution people that, you know, don't be buying seed off the internet, cheap seed off the internet. You need to work with somebody who's a reputable seed dealer who knows your area, who's willing to willing and knowledgeable to kind of uh, support you through that process because there have been instances of cheap seed from the, the internet being scrapings off the you know the shop floor and not not reputable seed and so on. So looks like we're about out of time. Uh, yes, we are. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we are at the end of our hour. <clears throat> Uh, and thank you for everyone for being here and for joining us. And thank you again to Eileen for this presentation. This was great getting some great comments uh, of gratitude in the in the chat box.